Greetings viewers, welcome to my channel, and today I am going to be working on my PV VB2 all tube bass amplifier head, specifically changing out a flaw from the factory and also doing a major cleanup on it. And as you can see, I've already taken the amplifier out of its casing there, and it's a lot of work to get to this point. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace the fuse, the high voltage fuse in the amplifier to make it more serviceable. So a little history on this amplifier. I picked this up. It was actually a uh, second hand. The guy that I bought it from bought it used from Guitar Center and bought it from him and it was working just fine. But I never really took it apart to see what was going on inside because the history of this amplifier history is always a good indicator of where you're from, is that this amplifier had one flaw and that the high voltage fuse for the tubes was actually soldered onto the board and it also was the wrong value. It, it was actually too low of an amperage and it would tend to pop more times than not. And then the fix for it was to increase the amperage rating of that fuse. So I believe it was originally equipped with a one and a half amp slow blow fuse on F2, which is what I'm referring to here. This is the fuse and it looks like it was actually changed out at one point. And that's good. I don't see the rating on it, but as you can see, to change out this fuse, you would have to remove the preamp board, which is this part right here. And that's a lot of work to do. Plus, it could also be dangerous because you can see all these high voltage capacitors. Thankfully, this amplifier does have bleeder resistors on those capacitors to discharge them after the amp has been turned off and unplugged for a while. Some tube amplifiers don't have that, and that could be extremely dangerous if you're working on any kind of amplifier that doesn't have bleeder resistors on the capacitors because that's high voltage DC, you could get seriously injured. Thankfully, I don't need to worry about that in this case. That's why I have gotten it disassembled to this level. So as you can see, I have the amplifier properly blocked so that it's level. You have your output transformer on the right and then the input transformer, the power transformer on the left there. And what I'm gonna do is gonna desolder these axial lead fuses here and put some external fuse holders and I'm gonna zip tie them here so that in the event that these things do pop, I don't have to take it apart like this. I'll just replace the fuse there and I should be all set. You know, in the event if I had to change anything on here, it'll be, I can get to it at this point, but I shouldn't have to do it for something as simple as a fuse. I'm also gonna to have to rebias the tubes when I get everything back together, I have all the tubes out. It's got a set of JJ's in there. I believe this was changed out at one point. The date, they look to be a match set, and it looks like they were from April of 2007. So it's been a, it's been a while since they've been in there. But when I checked the bias before I took everything apart, all the power tubes were somewhere around 29 to 30 milliamps a, a piece, which is good. And... John Fields, the, one of the designers of the amplifier, recommended 26, so I'll have to rebias it. And this is not as easy as my VB3, unfortunately, because you would need to put it in this service position, if you will. And the bias adjustment is right there, and it's not in the best place. It's right next to the high voltage capacitor, so I'll be wearing rubber gloves just to be on the safe side. But once I do that and get the tubes adjusted to about 26 milliamps per tube, then I'll be all set. Here's the work completed, at least for the board work anyway. I put in two fuse holders that are off the board. I've soldered their wires where the fuse that was originally soldered to the board, would, where they would go. They're actually right here. And it's a good thing I changed it because while this is a one amp fast blow, that's for F1, that was correct. The one over here that was added in afterward, it seems, because I did see that the solder was not original from the factory, it was still a 1.5 amp slow blow that was in there, and it calls for a 1.6 amp or a 2 amp. I'm going 1.6, and these are the original ones here, but they're still good. I can always still use them, but now they're, this is a standard 5 millimeter by 20 millimeter. You can just unscrew them, put them in, and then you're all done. There's no need to take anything off 
uh, as far as disassembling the board and lifting that board out. Now I can just service those fuses right here by sliding out the amplifier. Now that the fuse work is done, I'm going to use some electronic cleaner, CRC electronic cleaner, and clean out the sockets for all the tubes. I'm not going to use them on the potentiometers. I believe these are sealed potentiometers, and if I was going to use any kind of cleaner, it would likely be deoxic gold because it has not only the cleaner, which is just this, but it also has a lubricant so that the carbon trace in there won't prematurely wear out. This is not the stuff you would use on your pots there. It will definitely destroy them far quicker, especially if they're the carbon trace based uh, type of potentiometer. So don't use this for your potentiometer. It's okay to use for your tube sockets here because that will definitely get rid of it. Obviously, if you can afford it, deoxic gold is really what you want, but that stuff is expensive. Here's everything assembled for the test. I have my 210 TVX, which is a four ohm load connected. And I have all the tubes reinstalled with my Eurotubes probe that's going to measure the milliamp draw. I have it on the second tube to the, well, second tube to the right, depending on how you look at it. But I am going to be trying to measure 26 milliamps per tube. And I may check a few of the other tubes off camera. I'm going to have to do it a couple times just to make sure all the tubes are within that range so that one is not going too high a current and this is where my heart is beating a couple ticks faster just because i am now dealing with high voltage and i have rubber gloves on because now i'm going to have to carefully carefully adjust this right here so that i can adjust the milliamps per tube and i just don't want to take a chance being that these are so close to those power caps so here we go all right, false start on that test. So in the middle of that test, which I was not able to record, I was getting intermittent issues where the power tubes were all lit and they were running, but then I started getting like a low-level crackling noise. Like it just wasn't ru running right. And then, you know, you, what the what you usually do is you take a popsicle stick and you tap on each one, seeing one, if they're microphonic, and two, if they're, you know, any any kind of vibration. I hit this one, and it immediately went to red plate, and I'm like, okay, shut it down, which tells me that I have a couple bad sockets, and this is what I'm referring to. I already finished this one, so what happened was that these sockets, the pins inside, over time, expand and stretch out, and that's what likely happened, because if I look here, you can see on at least, I don't know how well I can get close to this, but if you look at that one up top there, right there in the middle, you see that the pins are pretty uh, close to the outside groove there. And I've already started to fix it here where you can make the pins a little bit tighter because I did see, while I did see some corrosion, that was, I didn't think it was that much of an issue, but apparently it was. So now what I got to do is I got to go through each one of these tube sockets, not only clean them up with the cleaner, but I'm going to use some deoxid, but I have to go through each one and push those pins back together so that they're a little bit tighter so it makes a good connection. And that should hopefully solve my issue that I ran into the other day. So till the next segment. Well, unfortunately, that was not a good test either, and one of the power tubes here decided to arc, and I did not have the standby switch on, which told me that there was definitely some internal issue there. These things are done. These are all dated from, looks like April 2007, August 2007, so they were once a matched set, but after over so many years of running, and if they weren't biased on a regular basis, they likely had a much shorter life, but then again... These are the original JJs that came with this amplifier, so the fact that they lasted as long as they did, maybe they were properly maintained, but it was so dirty when I got it, I can only imagine that a little bit of moving around from the transport and just the fact that those sockets, the pins were a little loose, it was just Murphy's Law that it was going to happen. So I'm going to have to get a whole new set of tubes here. I'm going to get the two 12AX7s, the one 12AT7 for the phase inverter, and a nice match set. 
And then at the recommendation of John Fields and Bobby Baldwin, the, the six CA7s from Electra Harmonix is what I'm going to go with. Uh, I've heard that al along the forums and everywhere of, that I could read about this amplifier. And they're just a really good uh, set of quality tubes there. So, yeah, that's not really what I was hoping to have to do. But you know what? A new set of tubes will do well with this amplifier. Now that I've been able to get all of these sockets cleaned up and taken care of, I've done the fuse modification, I shouldn't see any more issue with this uh, once I get those tubes. So let's order some tubes. While I'm waiting for my new tube set, I'm checking something else that I've read about this amplifier that has a potential problem. And thankfully I'm not seeing it here. What you're looking at on the meter is a diode test and specifically the flyback diodes that are meant to protect not only the power tubes and the sockets, but also the output transformer. Correcting a mistake that I had made before earlier in the video, this bigger transformer is the power transformer. The smaller one is the output transformer. And you can tell that it's the output transformer because it's going, one side of it is going out to the speaker connectors here. What I'm testing right now is the primary winding of the output transformer is connected right here. And what I'm looking to check because these diodes are actually on the top side of this board. These are uh, the flyback diodes are just meant to protect that the what I had mentioned before the power tubes, the sockets and the output transformer. If those uh, shorted or they weren't doing their job, this would tell me and it looks like I'm getting a consistent reading. The, the other one was 1.062. This is 1.071. And on the schematic here, this is what I'm talking about, the D13 and D14. Now, apparently, and I don't really know too much about tube amps, I'm learning this as I go, guys, so please bear with me. Uh, these diodes are not necessary uh, for, uh, for most tube amps, but they're there more as a safety than anything. And I believe it has something to do with how the construction of the modern output transformers are. You have more of a gap or something like that inside. It can take the transient voltages. That's what these diodes are here for, to suppress that any transient voltage and bleed it to ground so that you don't have any problems or any major arcing going on. So that's really what I wanted to verify that um, before I put any of the new power tubes in, that those diodes are testing correctly before I power anything up. I feel a lot more confident that this repair is going the right way now that I've checked those flyback diodes. I have read on the forums that that was a, a potential issue for this amplifier, and it seems to be common for a lot of PV amplifiers, pretty much any tube amplifier. It's just a good thing to do and check it because the worst thing that can that's running through my mind right now is that if I put a nice brand new set of power tubes and preamp pre tubes in there, and I didn't address something in here that could be causing the failure. It may not have been the tubes that were old and worn out. It could have been something in here that caused those tubes to fail. But, you know, chicken or the egg, it's, you, you never know. But I'm glad I, could ch I checked that. I've checked every other diode in here. I've replaced the 1.6 amp slow, bo slow blow fuse for, for F2 because it did pop when that uh, tube arced. And I checked the screen resistors, which are right here. They're each 400 ohms and 10 watts apiece. They're in parallel, so when I measure it, I get 200 ohms, which is right. And the only other thing that I may have to do, and this is going to have to be done eventually, is that these electrolytic caps will have to be replaced, all of them, because, you know, they just they get dried out, they wear out, and they start to leak voltage. You hear crackling, hissing, all, all kinds of other issues, possibly even catastrophic failure. But they look to be in very good shape. I don't see any bulging or anything like that. Uh, and all these other ones here look fine. I think I'm, that they're okay for now. But, uh, you know, I'm learning as I go, guys. This is uh, actually a lot of fun for me because, hey, you know, you get to see the guts of a tube amp. And this is a very, even though the amplifier is getting harder to find, it's still been well received by the community. And, hey, you know, if anyone has this amp, you get a good picture of what it looks like inside. So let's wait for the tubes and then we'll go to the next segment and get this thing hopefully fired back up. Okay, here's an update. I just got the new Electro Harmonix 6CA7 power tubes installed along with the matching preamp tubes, the 12AX7s, two of those, and then 112AT7. 
and I've been letting it run for about 15 minutes, already plugged in my bass here. I will show the next segment of this playing, but I was able to get this dialed in exactly right around 26 milliamps a tube, and I am like a kid in a candy store. I'm so happy of how this is running right now. In fact, there's no crackling, no buzzing, nothing like that. It's amazing what new tubes can actually do for an amplifier. So I'm gonna shut it down, let it cool off, and then start putting it back together. And then I gotta work on cleaning up the Tolex, fixing the tears there. And then I'm gonna add a little bit extra. Uh, one of the PV guys uh, in the Facebook forums asked if I was gonna put any LEDs inside the case, and why not? I think that's gonna make it look really nice. So that'll be for the next segment. Now that the amplifier is all done, I am doing the Tolex repair. And as you can see, I have some masking tape here to kind of hold down the Tolex where it was ripping and where the adhesive is starting to come off. I have a little bit of it inside, so I'm just having it on there right now until the glue dries. And this is the stuff I'm using. It's good for uh, fabric gluing and all that stuff. I think I use this for rebuilding a, a poker table, I think, a couple years ago. But that stuff's really good. So we're just waiting for that to dry. And then what we'll do is we'll paint with a paint stick any of these little scuff marks here. And we'll do a really nice uh, polish on the Tolex here so it's nice and shiny black. And it will look brand spanking new. Here is the amplifier all put back together, and I also installed some LEDs. Uh, I had some leftover 50-50 LED strips that I had used for another project, and then I got the leftover IR controller with the remote here so that now I can actually adjust it to where you know, the little things on the back. So I can do red, I can do green, and it's going to look really, really cool at night. And then, of course, my favorite is blue which really does match well with my VB3. As you can see, the Tolex looks really nice, glossy black and shiny. I've repaired all of the uh, rip portions as best I could, and anywhere that it was peeling, I just put in the new adhesive to make sure it stays in place. There are some areas with uh, that I had to go with the paint pen to make sure that it blended in, get rid of the scuff marks, so on the corner pieces, for example, but it really does look like a brand new amplifier. And then as far as the LED strips are concerned, I'll just do a, see if I can show you a quick aside here. It's pretty inconspicuous. You have the IR controller and a little 12 volt power supply. That should be easy enough to set up at a gig. But inside there is a strip towards the front grill, one strip on the short side here, and then another short strip right here, if you can see it. Maybe not the easiest, but it's there and it's specifically away from the power tubes here so we don't want that to you know melt the leds or anything like that but very happy for how it turned out well guys i'm going to end the video here but i will be doing a separate video of the sound demo with this amplifier i'm also going to include the vb3 on that uh, someone had suggested since i have both these amplifiers they're sibling amplifiers when they both came out around the same time to really kind of compare the uh, the clean and dirty channel, specifically the overdrive dirty channels of both the VB2 and the VB3. The VB3 actually still has its original Ruby tubes inside there. And then compared to the uh, big bottle Electro Harmonix, which is actually the biggest suggestion that I found with the VB3 and the VB2 to really get all the sound uh, quality that the this amplifier was meant to have. You know, we're going to try that out here in a separate video. But I want to give a big thank you to John Fields and Bobby Baldwin, who are the original designers of both these amplifiers. They really helped me with the technical aspect. I was kind of feeling my way through a lot of this uh, uh, off camera to make sure I was doing everything correctly because I really haven't had a lot of experience repairing tube amplifiers, especially at the level, especially with you know the fact that these power tubes arced and I had really no idea how to go about you know, not, it's not something as simple as just replacing power tubes, you know, because they, they burn out. Sometimes there could be something else that caused that. And when you're spending money on a good set of power tubes, you certainly don't want to spend any more money than you have to because of the fact that, you know, tubes can get very expensive and they're very hard to get right now. So thank you again to everyone for watching. If there's any questions, please let me know. But 
Till the next video. Cheers, guys.